So the first topic we're covering this morning is global trends and demographics. Obviously, this is really key to what's happening in the world, the global change and movement of people and technology, and ultimately very, very important to our real estate practice as well. We're going to hear from two leaders in, in this field who will share their, their thoughts on the global impact that this is having on our future. And our first speaker is Charles Kenny. Charles is a senior fellow at the Center for Global Development in Washington. He's going to speak to us today about how the world is changing and what his optimistic view of the future is. Charles? Thank you. Um, and thank you all. Um, I should not claim to be a, an expert in real estate, although I have used Airbnb. Uh, uh, but it's a delight to be here. Um, and I think my real purpose is to try and start off this day uh, making you a bit happier. Uh, so that's what I'm going to set as my task. My day job is to work uh, at a think tank in Washington, D.C. called the Center for Global Development. And at the center, we look at global development trends, uh, health and income and so on. And we look at what the United States is doing and how it's doing. We see what the impact of the global trends are on the United States, but also uh, what the United States is doing in order to make sure those trends continue. And if there's one short takeaway from what I'll say, it's that uh, global trends are really in the right direction. Um, we are seeing a massive amount of development progress. Uh, we, we live in a world that, for all its problems, is better than the world has ever been in history, and we're very lucky to be alive at this moment. One reason I'm very lucky to be alive at this moment uh, is this kid. Um, this is my daughter, Alex. Uh, it was taken when she was about six months old. Uh, she's now a happy uh, seven-year-old. Uh, she's uh, just gone off to school back in DC. And frankly, I can't imagine the pain I'd feel if I didn't know that she was happy and healthy and safe back in Washington, um, if I'd gone through the experience of her dying before her first birthday. This is an experience that I've, I've witnessed other parents go through. And I still can't imagine the pain. I've seen it, but I can't imagine it. And I think probably the single best way of expressing how much the world has got better is by trying to walk you through how many fewer kids are dying before their first birthday, how many fewer parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters are suffering that kind of pain. So I want to tell you a little bit about Niger. Niger is a small country in West Africa, population of about 15, 16 million. Most of it's desert. It's one of the very, very poorest countries in the world. Last week in Niger, this many Alexes were born, who thanks to progress in health in Niger, will be alive at the end of the year. If we had the mortality rates we had in Niger 30, 40 years ago, this many kids last week would be dead by the end of the year. Because of the progress, their parents were going to celebrate their first birthday with these kids. That's one country, one week, 794. This is the yearly total for Niger. That is 42,400 Alexes. I love Alex. I don't want 42,400 of them. But anyway, this is the yearly progress. In just one country, this many kids will survive to their first birthday thanks to progress against child mortality, against infant mortality. Globally, the number is 9 million kids. Nine million sets of parents, nine million sets of grandparents, and so on. Those kids are going to be alive thanks to, to, to the progress we've seen against infant mortality. Now, that is still far too, there are still far too many children dying of easily preventable causes worldwide. But just in the last 15 years, we've halved the number of children who die before their fifth birthday worldwide. Just massive, historically unprecedented progress. And it doesn't stop there. I mentioned Alex was going off to school this morning. I have to admit, quite often, she doesn't go off to school that willingly. Uh, she'd rather stay in bed reading a book. About 30, 25 years ago, I taught in a school in Zimbabwe. And I tell you what, the kids there, they were really happy to go to school. They knew the sacrifice that their parents were making to have them be in school. Zimbabwe is one of the poorest countries in the world. A lot of the parents who are sending their kids to school would have otherwise kept their kids at home to work on the family farm. Those parents were making the choice that there would be less food on the dinner table at the end of the day, 
but it was worth it for their kids to get an education and for their kids to have a better, better life in the future. And because of the sacrifice of parents like that, and because of governments providing schools and teachers doing incredible work teaching these kids, we've seen a real revolution in global access to education. So this is the proportion of kids of primary age, primary school age, who are actually in primary school over the last uh, uh, 40 years. Worldwide, we've gone from about 70% to way over 90% of kids who should be in primary school being in school. In sub-Saharan Africa, including, you know, the, where Niger and Zimbabwe are, we've seen that progress even faster. It's still behind, but we've gone from less than half to nearly three quarters of kids who should be in school because they're a primary school age actually being in school. That's making a massive difference to a whole range of outcomes. Kids who go to school, uh, uh, their children are less likely to die uh, in, in, you know, when they're young. Uh, people who go to school, they earn more. You know, the huge amount of effects from going, going through school, and we're seeing more and more schooling happen. And those kids live in a world that is actually safer than it's ever been before. Violence is on the decline. This is a graph of the global number of people each year who died on the battlefield. The, the first and biggest spike is the Korean War. The second spike is the Vietnam War and, and the other wars of Southeast Asia. You'll see at the very end there's a red line going up. That, that red line, sadly, is Syria, um, and it is a tragic, tragic conflict that is ongoing in Syria. But you'll see from the trend that it is increasingly the exception. Most of the world is more at peace than it's ever been. Murder rates are going down, battle deaths are going down, the number of wars going on is going down. It is a more peaceful and more secure world. Afghanistan still accounts for some of those battle deaths. And I'm not saying, especially after the events of the last few days, that we can declare a success in Afghanistan yet. But I will say there's been progress even in Afghanistan. And one of the ways you can measure that is by this picture. This is a woman who's just gone to vote. The reason her finger's blue is when you go to vote in Afghanistan, they cover your finger in blue ink so you can't go back and vote again. She got to vote. That anybody in Afghanistan got to vote is a bit of a revolution, but that women got to vote in Afghanistan uh, is a real change from what we've been seeing the last 30 years in that country. Real advances in, in civil and political rights. And they are spreading worldwide. So in 1945, there were maybe nine countries you could call a democracy, worldwide, nine. By the end of the Cold War, 38. By now, around 87, more than half the population of the world now lives in a country that is fairly safely democratic. So our kids are more likely to survive childhood. They're more likely to go to school. They're living in a more secure, safe environment. And they're more likely to have their civil and political rights respected. But the good news doesn't stop there, because you all know what your kids are spending most of their time doing, right? They're texting. But it's not just your kids, it's not just uh, kids in the United States, it's a worldwide phenomenon. During the late early 2000s, I actually worked uh, in Afghanistan on telecommunications. I was uh, helping the government uh, set up the policies and regulations to get uh, telephone service up and running. When I arrived in Afghanistan in 2002, there was one cell phone provider that had two cell phone towers providing service to a few very rich and lucky people and Kabul. By the time I left four years later, there were three cell phone providers who had covered about uh, half the country in a cell phone signal, and 20 to 30 percent of the population had access to a cell phone. Phenomenal change. I want to take credit for all of it, but actually it had almost nothing to do with me, and the reason you know that, uh, beyond the fact it's probably pretty obvious, is that it was a glo global phenomenon. I want to take you back to Niger. 1996, there were no mobile phones in Niger, not a single one. By 1997, I'd seen a bit of progress, and got up to 98 mobile phones in the entire country. This is a country the size of, twice the size of Texas. But only a year later, we got up to 1,349 mobile phones in Niger. And by 2014, the number of mobile phones in Niger had climbed to 8 million. That's more than one for every two people uh, in Niger. This is one of the very poorest countries in the world with huge desert spaces. Nonetheless, the vast majority of Nigeria have access to a mobile phone. And that's part of a global phenomenon, obviously. Seven billion mobile subscribers worldwide nowadays. 
mass spread of a really honestly a life-changing technology. And it's not the only one. We've seen vaccine spread, we've seen bed net spread, we've seen wire, plastic sheeting, a whole bunch of technologies have spread worldwide which really are improving the quality of life. And one more obvious one is the reason you can see large chunks of, night, of, of the Earth at night. This is a picture from NASA. Uh, you can tell what's behind this. It's the spread of electricity. The, you know, the, light bit, or the white bits are where there's a lot of light. Turns out that if you were a Martian and you knew nothing about economic development on the planet, you could learn a lot from this picture. For a start, you might be able to see on the very edge uh, of Asia there, you can see all of Japan kind of um, marked out in lights. It's a very population dense and rich country, so uh, it's pretty much all lit up at night. Um, right next to Japan, there's a blob, which kind of looks like it's floating uh, in the sea between Japan and Asia, the mainland. Um, that's South Korea. The reason it looks like a blob uh, rather than connected to the Asian mainland as it actually is, is because right to the north of South Korea is one of the world's great development failures, North Korea, which looks completely dark at night because nobody has electricity. But South Korea, I'm sorry, North Korea really is a, a, in a small category of exceptions to a general rule of massive development progress worldwide, every continent, almost every country. We've seen these increases in health, these increases in education, these increases in liberty, this increasing security, the rollout of infrastructure, and that has had an effect on another measure of the quality of life, which is how much money do you have? The yellow dots here are the proportion of the world that live below a dollar a day. The red dots, um, a more recent series of data, but the number of people who live on less than a dollar 25 a day. Stop and think for a moment about what living on a dollar 25 a day means. Some of you this morning will have bought a cup of coffee before you came in here, probably cost twice that. This is what these people have to live on for food, for housing, for medicine, for school supplies, all of their needs. $1.25 a day, these people are living on less than that. Only a few decades ago, more than half the population of the planet lived on less than that. Today, the numbers came out from the World Bank just, just yesterday, we can say that fewer than 10% of the planet lives on less than $1.25 a day. Huge progress in lifting people out of extreme poverty. One big reason behind that is a growing global economy, and in particular, an economy that is growing very fast in developing countries. This is just a graph of global economic output, yearly output, um, over the last uh, 20, 20 or so years. Today, global output is in the region of $100 trillion. Um, back in 1990, it was half that, a bit less than half that. Back in 1990, developing countries accounted for a third of global output. Today, they account for more than half of global output. That's what's been driving the drops in poverty, and I think that all of these forces like education and infrastructure and civil and political rights and increasing peace is what's been driving the increases in economic growth. Which leads to one more thing that's been getting better. World Values Survey, a survey company, actually goes around the world asking people, when you take your life as a whole, do you consider yourself not very happy? somewhat happy or very happy? Ask thousands of people all around the world this question. Uh, collates the results. Been going on for 20 some odd years. From that data, I can say that since we've had data, the world has never been a happier place. More and more people are saying they are happy. And I don't think that's too surprising given all of these trends to better health and education and civil and political rights that we've seen. But it's not just that they should be happy. I think you should be happy, and America should be happy about this. Now, one reason why is a kind of selfish one, I guess. Um, we're still incredibly, incredibly lucky. I know it doesn't always seem that way, and I know there is a lot of suffering in this country, but compared to global averages, we are doing fantastically. The global median income is on the level of $3,650. To get into the top 1% of global incomes, top 1%, you have to earn $34,000. I would bet the majority of people in this room carefully, safely hurdle that. You're in the top 1% globally. 
to get to the top percent, uh, five percent of the United States for comparison, um, which would put you in the top 0, 0.0 something percent of the world, uh, you, you need an income uh, of 230,000. But the fact of the matter is, pretty much everybody in this room, for all they may have money problems, don't have money problems on anything uh, uh, the extent to which the majority of the world does. So even though the developing world is getting richer, we're still far, far ahead. And that's true not just of money, it's true of uh, education outcomes and health outcomes and pretty much every other outcome uh, people care about. So that's one reason, I guess, to be happy. Um, uh, but perhaps more importantly, of course, the rest of the world getting richer isn't bad for us, it's good for us. Here's one simple reason why. When the rest of the world gets richer, they buy more stuff, and some of the stuff they buy comes from the United States. The majority of US exports nowadays go to developing country markets. Those are the markets that are growing fast. This is great news for the US. And developing countries getting richer means they invest more here, there are more opportunities for us to invest there. It means they uh, invent stuff that we use. China invented paper and fireworks. We're quite happy about that, I'd imagine. Um, so you know, the more that the rest of the world gets rich and healthy and educated, the more we get rich and healthy and educated, and I hope happy. But just in case you think I'm getting too Paglossian, not everything is going in the right direction, and we still have a long way to go. On the not everything is going in the right direction front, carbon dioxide output is going up worldwide. China is now the largest producer of, of carbon dioxide worldwide. That, if we don't do anything about it, is going to create real trouble. A warming climate uh, will probably have its biggest impacts in the developing world, especially on developing countries' farming, but it will have global impacts. Um, and that could derail progress if we let it go on long enough. The good news is that we're already making some progress against that. So, for example, last year, more renewable energy was added to the grid uh, than uh, fossil energy worldwide. So we're already starting the transition to uh, uh, energy sources that won't fry the planet. So I think there's good news there. The second caveat, and I can't emphasize this enough, there are still billions of people living lives of deprivation I could never understand. There are still people in the United States, for all its wealth, living lives of deprivation that I could never understand. And, and I'm, I have to say I'm glad about that, that I could never understand it. What I would say is the fact that we've seen all of this progress, and there is reason to believe this progress will continue, is reasons for hope. It's reasons to think that that deprivation is going to go down over time. And so that makes me optimistic about the future. It makes me op optimistic about the future of the planet. And being optimistic about the future of the planet makes me optimistic about the future of the United States. And being optimistic about the future of the United States makes me optimistic for you. So please be happy. Thank you. <laughs>